Using the Institute of Basic Youth Conflicts, we are discussing the principles of life that govern those areas that we have chosen to study and apply to ourselves that we might have, as it were, the instructions from the Word of God that we could apply to our own lifestyle to make choices that are correctly fitting into the way that God would have us to arrange our lives so that we would take the wisdom that has been applied from ages past and from teachers and elders and deacons and people that have gone before us, that we could learn from them and apply it to ourselves, that we would grow therein so we would not waste time or make the same mistakes over again, but that rather we would choose a path and we would walk on that path and we would direct our life according to those principles that God has given us as He has set way markers on the way to teach us the way that we should go. For it is said that in the book of Proverbs that it is instructions in wisdom, in knowledge, in growth, in development, and the way that a young man should arrange his life. Well, just like Proverbs has been given for those who understood the Proverbs to live their life accordingly, and Ecclesiastes was written as such, likewise we have a book, and some people have said that they don't know what to do in their life because they don't know how to apply the Bible and the scriptures in their life. So. In examining principles of life, I have found that in this book, I was greatly blessed in using it and reading it and applying it to my life. So we've used principles of life in the first six videos, maybe seven, to explain stages that you go through or areas of conflict that you need to resolve. And in each one of these, we're beginning to get into now the depth and the material that this book was designed for. And building upon that, principles of life that we had already previously recorded, we're now on our first principle, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> it's a biggie. <laughs> it's the most important one. No. Principles are simply things that, they're kind of like, how would you describe a principle? Well, he's the guy that's at school, you know, that you got sent to when the teacher said, I can't handle him, and sent you to the principal. Not that principle. <laughs> but it's similar. It's close. It's kind of like the same idea. Only, before you get to the principle, there's principles that you could have used to avoid having to get thrown out of class. Because while you were in class, if you had listened and paid attention, those are called principles. Listening is a principle. Paying attention is a principle. Those are things that are called principles. Those are ways of applying what you're learning or ways to apply something and that's what a principle is a way to apply something you could call it you know for big words pragmatic or practical a way of using something it's kind of like you know when you have a hammer you could use that hammer as a guitar no really you could you know you could sit there and imagine that that strumming that hammer is really going to make a lot of wonderful sounds but the principle of education teaches us that the hammer was used for striking a nail. That's applying a principle. What it's designed for is what it's made for. That's what you use it for. That's a principle. Design, made, use. That's what we're doing in today's study. We're looking at, as we're going to read it and then apply it as we comment on it, principles in applying scripture. These are ways to apply the scripture. It isn't the only way. It isn't the best way or the worst way. This is a way. Now remember, again, let me say it very clearly. What you learn and how you apply it is based upon your knowledge of God himself working in your life by the Holy Spirit, taking what's being said now and using it in your life so that you can apply it to yourself. It's kind of like, if I take this tie off, and you're wearing a purple shirt, and you put it on, it might go together, and it might not. If you're wearing a pink shirt, it might go with it, it might not. I might take off my shirt and hand it to you, but if you're like, say, maybe six foot seven, and you're like 300 pounds, this shirt isn't going to fit you. So what fits for you is how you apply what's being taught right now, and the same thing is true about Scripture. The Holy Spirit is your teacher. The Holy Spirit applies the scripture to your life. The Holy Spirit is the one that makes it fit for you. No one is telling you what to do. 
Only the Holy Spirit convinces you and convicts you in the way you should go. As he does that, the convincing part is the way that you should go if you want to avoid being convicted by him when you didn't do what he said to do. And that's how God uses his spirit now in the world to teach us by the word of God how to live our lives. So one of the principles in applying scripture is, or I should read the definition of applying scripture is, it is essential that all scripture be diligently studied and accurately applied. When we say diligently study, we're talking about not just simply going to your local video store or video and picking up a video and saying, hey, I'm going to watch it and I'll know. That's not a Bible study. I'm sorry. Going to a Bible study in a church where a pastor stands up and preaches at you and calls it a teaching is not a teaching or a preaching. I mean, it's not a teaching or a Bible study. It is a expository expounding upon what he has learned and then you have to do your part in order to apply it, learn it, be it, and do it. So that's not a Bible study either. A Bible study and the way that you apply it is when you take something from the scripture and you practically make it real in your life by way of the Holy Spirit coming to you and saying, look, it says don't sin and then you see that a sign says don't cross the crosswalk when it's red and you walk out there and get hit by a truck. You don't blame God because you got hit by a truck because you sinned by going against the crosswalk. That's the practical application of a Bible study. The Bible study is to say, why would I obey that stupid law when there's nobody coming and there's nothing all around me? You see, I can see that there's a red light. I'm at a street corner. It's the middle of the night. Nobody's watching. Nobody can see me. Nobody knows whether I cross that crosswalk or not. But I'm not going to wait for that green light. I'm just going to go ahead and go because, hey, I've got, I've got what I believe is grace. I believe I can do whatever I want to do. That's true. Nobody sees you until you study. And then you suddenly find out, wait a minute, angels are watching every move I make? Angels are recording every word that I take? Angels are watching everything that I do in order to understand what this salvation is? You mean I've been put on a central stage in front of all these angels that are being condemned and all these angels are being made righteous and they're all watching everything that I do because I call myself a Christian? Yes, as a matter of fact, it's true. Angels study everything you're doing. They are there to learn from you. You are teaching by your lifestyle, by your words, by your actions, by the attitudes of your heart and everything that's going inside you what angels don't know. Because God didn't create them with that capacity that you have. Angels weren't created in the image and likeness of God. You were. Angels were created as ministering spirits. That's what they are. They are not created in the image of God. You are. You are a tripartite being with a body, a soul, and a spirit. You are created in the likeness and the image of God. Because you are, you, though lower than an angel currently, you will be ascended into an angel above them, likened unto the Son of God, and you are being revealed as you are living out your life now. And all of creation is in travail, waiting for you to be revealed so that they too likewise would rejoice in you accomplishing your purpose that God has designed from the moment He saved you and placed His Spirit in you. You became at that moment an example of God's new creation in the world of the old creation that it is looking to see what you will do and how you will do it. So in the middle of the night, you standing there, would you obey the law or disobey? Would you break the law or would you not break the law? Jesus lived the perfect life. The choice would be yours. I would say, very simply, and this is where you don't understand what sometimes principles are until you apply them in life. When the law says, and if we were very dogmatic about it, that you can't cross the crosswalk because there's a red light that says don't walk and you stop and you say, God, I'm not going to cross that crosswalk because I know angels are watching. I know angels are paying attention to everything I do. I know angels are wanting to understand why I'm not going to cross this crosswalk. Dead of night, no one around, I could get away with it, I could just go ahead and cross. But I'm not going to, God, because the law says I'm not going to cross. Well, that's one way of looking at it. But you see, because we're in a Bible study and we want to accurately apply our study, 
the answer to what you do is based upon if you ask God what to do. You see how that goes? Your obedience isn't to the law. Your obedience is to God. You could have a dogmatic relationship to the Word of God and automatically always obey the law. Or you could ask God what He wants you to do in a given situation where it looks like you would break the law. Because there's a greater law at work when you ask God what He wants you to do. You simply ask Him, Lord, it's the middle of the night. You want me to cross? God, I know angels are watching. But you know, Lord, you're the law giver. You gave the law. You have a greater reason to be above the law and you can exist outside of the law. So whatever it is you tell me to do, that I should do. So God, what do you want me to do? And God may tell you as a lesson in patience to stand there and wait for the light to change. <laughs> but the next time you come to that situation, as angels are watching and they know exactly what happened last time, you'll do the same thing. You'll ask, well, God, what do you want me to do? And God will say, cross. And you will, because you'll obey. And the angels go, what? That don't make no sense. To obey is better than sacrifice. You see, there's always a scripture that applies. So when you have a conflict of how to apply scripture, it is answered in your relationship with God. There has to always be that one-on-one -on -one direct information from God himself to apply it to you or else you will make it into a law that will put you into a box and you will always be dogmatically stuck in one way of doing things. People tell me Jesus didn't break the law. Well, he didn't only in one way. He didn't break the law as far as God was concerned, but he broke the law as far as the Pharisees were concerned. He broke man-made laws. He didn't break any divine law. Bottom line is he fulfilled it. So, being the lawgiver, he couldn't break it. It's obviously a contradiction in terms because it's the application of the circumstance within the reality of who he was as opposed to what he did. When you recognize that, and you can replay this tape at any point in time when you see that there's some kind of situation that you don't understand and you don't really get the conflict, write it down. Start to work it out. Put the circumstances together and see if you get a grasp on what I'm saying or what's being taught here. Because conflict is what the problem is. You are going to run into conflict all the time. You are going to run into scriptures that look like, on the surface, they contradict each other. And except you study and know how to apply the scripture, they do contradict. They obviously contradict. They obviously war against itself until you know how to apply it. Then once you see how it fits, because you see, all of scripture fits together. It fits together and when it doesn't, you're the one in conflict, not the scripture. Your way of applying it causes you to fit into that perfect picture that God has in the Word of God. That's why applying scriptures and the principles that we use is so important. That's why I only read one line and stopped and commented on it because it's how you diligently apply it, how you diligently look at it, how you work it out in your life by asking God always for wisdom. Because the difference between the theologian who fails and the simple believer who succeeds is one thing. Ask. Jesus made it so simple for us. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. Because the scripture had already been written. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but giveth to all men liberally. God said, if you ask me for wisdom, I will give it to you. I will give it to you. He didn't say, I'll send you there. He didn't say, I'll take you there. He didn't say, I'll make you there. He said, I will give you wisdom. How complicated can that be? Ask and you shall receive. I will give you wisdom. Very simple. That's how we apply it. Because in everything that you read in the Bible, you're going to run into conflict. People told me when I was first saved, I should read Genesis all the way through Revelation. I started Genesis, got thoroughly confused, and threw the Bible away. When I finally got another Bible, I got a little pocket New Testament, and it made sense, because actually it had Psalms and Proverbs in the front, and I kind of liked Psalms, you know, that was kind of cool. You know, then I read Proverbs, and I went, wow, man, I didn't know there was instructions here. I didn't know that's what I was supposed to do. Then I kind of opened up, you know, and I saw Matthew, and I started reading it, and then I found out all about Jesus. Wow, that was pretty neat, you know? So I don't understand, you know, always the way people explain things to other people, but I can tell you what the principles of application are. Let God lead you. 
God will lead you. Let God guide you. God will guide you. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God who will up and give it to all and liberally. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 covers everything in my life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not in thine own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Principles. They fit. So, it is essential that all scripture be diligently studied and accurately applied. All scripture. Remember that. It's essential. You're working on the bare necessities of life. No, we're not going to give you those bare necessities. We're going to tell you what they are, and you are going to get those bare necessities you need for life, because that's your principles of living. How you arrange your life is your choice. You can do anything you want to do. You've been given grace. But the accountability factor of how you apply the scripture and how you live your life will be demonstrated to all the angels in heaven, and you will stand before Jesus and answer for your life and give an accounting for what you've done in your life. That's the principles of life. That's a principle of reality, actually. That's actually the factual documentation of accountability. So, each application must be in harmony with the total meaning of Scripture. Listen to that again. Think about that. Every way and every time you apply the Scripture, it must be in harmony with the rest of the Scripture. You can't take it out here and put it there, or put it there and put it in here. It all has to fit. Harmonizing or in harmony means in music that you're not singing a note that's off key. You're not going out in left field, you know, and saying, hey, you know what, I got this new teaching, you know, that I really like, but it doesn't fit with some of these other things. The way that you can usually tell if you don't hear from God directly, and you're only using, just so you understand, if you're only using the principle of application of Scripture, meaning that you're applying the principles of studying the Scripture and you're studying it for yourself on your own and you just want to study it, whenever you find conflict, then you know something's wrong. But, also, write this down. Whenever you find an exception, you're wrong. There is no exception. It fits. You can't take a piece of the puzzle and put it outside the picture and say, oh, well, the picture's complete. You have to take all the pieces of the puzzle, put it together, and it has to make a picture. That's what we're saying right here now, that each application must be in harmony with the total meaning and message of the scripture, not from an isolated verse taken out of context. So when you are applying scripture, how you are looking at it in principles of application, you have to make it fit. You don't make it fit by just rearranging the scriptures. You don't make it fit by telling us what it means, you make it fit by letting it tell you how it fits. Because usually if you read in context, above the scripture or below the scripture, it will explain itself. The Bible has been called a communicative device with which a supreme being and sovereign existing outside of time is able to communicate to man by way of the intervention of the spirit in man that he would be able to cognitively know what God's will is at any point in time that God could speak to them through the scripture as it's highlighted or made applicable to that person in their circumstances of life as God alone could do so by his sovereign will and ability to know what was going to happen in that life at the time that it does which is called prophecy. The Bible is called a book of prophecy because he knows where you're going to be at the time that you're going to read it, so he already arranged the way that you were going to read it and things that you're going to do so that it would fit your circumstances at the time that you need it. That's how it works. That's why it's called a communicative device. That's only one aspect of it. One. It's a Bible two-way talk radio. It does. It talks to you, you talk to it. God's speaking in between. You're on one end of the line, he's on the other. In between the lines is the Bible. Word of God. But also, it is an application of principles to live by. And that's why you see such a religious aspect of it. There is a lot of religion in it. A lot of religion application that we should do. Because religion and relationship, as we've already demonstrated at the beginning of application of this, fits hand in hand, like a glove and a hand. The relationship is the hand, the hand which is going to do things. The glove is the religion that protects the hand and keeps it from being damaged in some way. So you don't want to damage your relationship, so you have religion to help you from damaging your hand. That's the work glove you put on, religion. The hand is relationship. Just like you reach your hand out, you put a glove on it, and that's what religion does for you. It helps you to reach out and to grasp God, or to use 
that with which you want to do something for God, then your religion helps you and it covers you so that you don't damage your hand in doing and applying it. Religion and relationship. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Basic principle. Straight up, straightforward. We are to study to show ourselves approved unto God as workmen who do not need to be ashamed, knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 It's always interesting when you read a scripture because most people don't read the scripture. They skim it. They speak it. They slip right through it because they don't take it apart. A Bible study takes it apart, looks at it, and says, let me chew on that for a minute. Let me meditate a foreign word to some Christians. But let me consider and ponder and let me figure out how this and what this is saying. We... So, first of all, we have to think about when we used to talk about this in English grammar lit or English grammar appreciation, we used to say, hey, take it apart. You know, Don't be embarrassed. Don't, don't be afraid of stopping what you're reading in order to get more out of it. Because in the Bible, since we are being serious about what we're studying and we're no longer just listening to someone tickling our ears or dictating to us what they believe in, you now are responsible for teaching angels and making them aware of what you're learning so they will learn. So when you stop and look and examine scriptures and tear it apart and look at it as it is written, then you're beginning to get a hold of what it really means. You're beginning to make it apply to your life. So when you do, you want to look at each individual dot and tittle, as Jesus said, because it's not going to be removed. It's going to apply. And you're going to get something out of it every time you do. So when we talk about this 2 Timothy 2.15, we kind of look at it when we say, we are to study. You know, it's a study because it's a command to you. Um, it doesn't actually say in 2 Timothy, we, but it says study to show thyself approved. So when you study, you're told immediately not just to read it and not just to hear it, but to study it. So you are tearing it apart because you're told to. It's in a command form. So we study to show ourselves approved unto God. If you ever want to know how to be approved, then you know that you're required by God to study. You want to know what the will of God is? Study. You want to know what God's will is for you? Study. You want to know how to be approved by God? Study. You want to know how to get God's favor? Study. It all fits. Do you see what it says? Study. It's not read it. It's not hear it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. It's nice that you memorize. Memorization is memorizing. But study is study. This says bluntly, if you want to be approved unto God, you study. It says, who need not be ashamed? In other words, there's time for you will be ashamed because you'll make a mistake. You won't apply the principles correctly. You'll stand there at a crosswalk looking stupid when somebody walks up and says, hey, you know what? God told me to tell you to cross the crosswalk. And you walk out there and you get run over by a truck. And you get into heaven and you say, God, I got run over by a truck. And he says, yeah, who'd you listen to? Well, I listened to the guy that told me God said. Yeah, that's why you're dead. You see, there is a proverb that's taught by that in the Old Testament. When two prophets were meeting together in the land of Israel. One prophet, the young one, was told to go through and don't spend the time and night or day, but to pass through the land and don't be and stop anywhere until you get to your destination. The old prophet came along and said, Hey, I just talked to God and God told me to tell you to come along and follow me and I'm taking you home. We're going to have dinner and then you're going to go on your way. So the young prophet went to the old prophet's house, sat down, had dinner, got up in the morning, walked out the door, got ate by a lion. And then he got torn up by a bear. The old prophet went out and buried the young prophet. Lesson to be learned. You do what God tells you to do. You do it as God says to do it. You do what God says to do. That's the principle that's applied. It is in the Old Testament. It is there in Scripture. It's in... I want to say kings. <laughs> Everybody always wants to know the address. You know what I'm saying? Study. I don't memorize those things. I study them. So, you don't need to be ashamed by what you're doing whenever God puts you in a position of you're doing it by obedience because to obey is better than sacrifice. But we are commanded to study to show ourselves approved unto God so that you will be approved as workmen who do not need to be ashamed knowing how to rightly divide the word of truth. You don't divide it by way of saying, split it up. That's not what he's talking about. When you... If you don't know math, this might not make sense to you. <laughs> but you can look it up on equations and math. 
But when you do math, you have equations that have to fit on both sides of the the equal mark. They have to be equal. They balance. Mathematic is a is a math is a science of equalities. They have to balance out. They have to equal something. You know, one plus one equals one. And if you have a negative one plus one plus one, to get rid of that, you put a plus one on the opposite side, and they balance out, and then they become an equation. And all your equations have to work out equal. And a lot of Life is determined by equational analysis in mathematics because God, believe it or not, what looks like to you as chaos is really a mathematical equation that works out perfectly. It makes sense. It's equation. <laughs> it's the way he equates it to us. But anyways, having said that, division has rules that apply that when you split it up, you still have to make it fit. And so, if you're dividing something, you're still fitting it back into an equation that you should be able to, when you take something out, multiply it back in and it fits. But more often than not, when someone tries to divide the Word of God, they don't put it back in and their conclusions are only based upon the divisive part, not on the inclusive part. So they don't balance their equation when they're studying the Word of God and dividing it. That's why rightly dividing doesn't mean to divide by way of math. It means to rightly look at and to analyze the parts of the scripture like we said at the beginning. Study to show thyself, study to show ourselves approved unto God. What do we have to do to be approved? That's dividing it. What do we have to do? We study. You see how that's division? That's coming up to a conclusion by taking the portions of it apart, dividing it into its equal parts, and then saying to ourselves, what's the conclusion that we come out of that by taking it apart and looking at all parts of it and all aspects of it? Putting the common denominators together and putting it over the equal sign. That way we make it applicable to ourselves. If you don't understand that, rewind. <laughs> I love that idea. <laughs> First principle, A. And you thought, and it's only one page. See how long this takes? That's why it's principles of life. Life doesn't happen because you were born. Life doesn't happen because you're living. Principles of life is the fact of you applying ways and means to make life worth living and living it in a way that is both beneficial, abundant, and fulfilling in the sense of God filling you up with all of himself from top to bottom and in between that you affect all the lives around you as well as those spiritual lives, emotional life, and physical life that you live in. Because you are a tripart being that you affect everyone spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Big deal, this thing called life. It's a lot more to it than you ever thought. And as you study it, as you can see, we have a long ways to go. A lot of life to live. That's why they're principles. Working through the text. Before any application of scripture can be made, there must be a thorough understanding of what the text is actually saying. What does it say? The Bible says what it means, it means what it says. First thing we do is we look at why was it written? It may say so, write in it. These things were written unto you that you should know that you have eternal life, and this life is in the Son. He who has the Son hath life, he has not the Son of God. These things were written unto you that you should have assurances. A lot of times, and it's only rare, but usually in scripture somewhere it'll say why it was written. So you have to ask yourself, why was it written? Well, on the one hand, we could say historically it was written for those at that time for their purpose. But since it applies to us, why was it written? For our benefit. It was written for some reason to apply to us. So when you put down why it was written, there's more than one way to look at that. And that's why the Holy Spirit has to help you, to guide you, and allow you to instruct you in righteousness. Because the right way, or that's what righteousness means, doing it the right way, isn't just historical. That's the religious. If you put the relationship in it, then you have to add your relationship to it. Why was it written to you? Why was it written to them? Why was it written at all? Three parts, always look at. There's always three ways to look at. There's actually seven. But I'm just going to give you three. So, you know, why was it written in the past, the present, and the future? The things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. 
the same principles of that scripture that applied in the book of Revelation, that Revelation is a condensed version of the entire scriptures that are put in from Genesis all the way through, and that is the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave unto him to reveal unto his servants that things which shall be and things which were and things which are. The same thing is true about this when we apply it in the Bible. It goes through all of scriptures, the things which were, the things which are, and the things which shall be. From the Father, the Son, and the Spirit applying to you personally, practically, and spiritually. Three part time. Now the seven it get a little strange, so we're not gonna be here for the next seven years to explain that. Because <laughs> believe me, I could go there and I'd love to. It's like, ah, yeah, let's get into the seven. Because <laughs> once you get after done done with the seven and you really have that grasping in your mind, I won't tell you where you go next. To whom was it written? Take a scripture, write it down, look it up. You got devotionals, you got uh, commentary. Study Bibles are the best things to have. It'll tell you right there usually why it was written. So, get a study Bible, but apply it in those three parts. To whom was it written? Well, obviously, if we said those three part types, it was written to them back then, it was written to someone in the future, and it's written to you right now. Deal with it. What were the conditions at the time? How did they apply in that respect to what the things were going on then? How does it apply to you in respect to the things that are going on now? And how will it apply to you in the respect to the things that are going on in your future? Because you see, it will apply. The scripture always applies to you, but they're trying to get you to understand just the historical background of it. Because they don't want you to apply it in the way I'm saying. They want you to apply it in a limited way of a religious aspect to only fit it for that particular time. Which is nice. It's good. If you want to be a theologian, stick with only the theology of it and you'll be stuck in one aspect of it, the physical reality, but not the emotional or spiritual. It won't apply to you today. It'll only apply as a general theme of a religious aspect that you'll have a glove with one finger. You want a glove with all fingers and a thumb. Notice that I said, and a thumb. Every word has a meaning, and the meaning of the word fits the meaning of the word. It says what it means, it means what it says. That's why we don't have five fingers. We have four fingers and one thumb. A thumb is not a finger. What is the precise meaning of the original language? Bible studies sometimes go overboard on the precise meaning of the original language. I can tell you that you don't need that. I can tell you that it doesn't apply. And it's true, because the Holy Spirit will take whatever Bible you're reading and apply it. So, when you take the original language it was written in, it was written by the Spirit of God. So because it's written by the Spirit of God, only the Spirit of God can apply the right language to you in the way that you understand it. It doesn't have to do with the Greek or the Hebrew. Forget that. Get that out of your head. It wasn't the Greeks that wrote it, and it wasn't the Hebrews that wrote it. It was the Holy Spirit that wrote it. So, the original language, as it should be applied, is by way of the Holy Spirit making that mindset you have in your colloquialisms, in your level of education, in your understanding and your principles of understanding as He has led you in your life to where you are today, then that's the language that He will speak to you in in the Bible that you're reading. If you happen to have a street version Bible, hey man, it's rapping and it's japping and it's tapping and it's giving you what you got to get when you got to get it when you want to need it. Because when you need it, you got to have it, and then you're going to go with it, right? Got it? Good. To get it. So, that's how the Holy Spirit will apply it, no matter what language you think that you need to have it in. The Greek is just for intellectual assertion. The Hebrew is just for intellectual adaption. It is true that there's a certain amount of benefit to them, but most often than not, I see more people get trapped in a box of their own understanding than the reality of the Holy Spirit making it applicable to all means of the language. Whether it be what was, which would be, again, the Hebrew or the Greek, what is where you're at today, and what shall be hereafter where your education process with the Holy Spirit will take you as you learn more about it and you apply it. So you see, still applies. It could still be the Greek Hebrew that you're learning from what was, and then what is, and what shall be. It all fits together. There isn't anything in the principles of life that I'm going to give you that doesn't fit. If you ever think it doesn't, challenge me. Call me up. <laughs> Michael, I got you. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm going to nail your hide to the wall. Let me write it down and get send it to you. And I'll 
feed it back to you. Because <laughs> I've been nailed. <laughs> I don't have the nail prints. You know, they tried to get me on that cross and I crawled out of it. No, actually, the, you know, I've been crucified lots of times. You know, I mean, people always come at me trying to say that something doesn't fit. I'm not the teacher. I know it fits because God has used this and has applied it for you to the benefit that we're using it in video that God said do it so I know that it'll fit because I have no problem with being challenged. I know that God will give me the answer to the reason for the hope that lies within me that I shall always be able to give an answer to every man that asks me other questions of how it applies according to their understanding and their reasoning within wherever they're coming from at that point in time that they're writing to me the questions that they have about how the Holy Spirit would apply this to their life according to the teaching that I was giving at the time that I recorded it. Want to try? <laughs> what related scriptures explain it further? That's always why the pieces of the puzzle fit, because there are other pieces that go with it that'll, you know, kind of like help you to understand it. So you just read it before and after and in between and all aspects of it, and you could kind of don't change the meaning of it because what it says it means it means what it says and where it's where it is is what it is the way it is the way it's written so just leave it as it is and read it for what it amounts to but you can get some insight into it by other scriptures around it and that's what they're talking about working through the text the working part is that aspect where you are really tearing into it and getting into it and getting all that you possibly can out of it you're chewing on it you know you're Cutting it up, you know, kind of like taking a knife and taking, you know, your, your fork and sticking it in there and kind of slicing and dicing and moving it around and kind of understanding it. So that's what it means to work through the text. It should be personal. It should be real. It should be, I would say, on paper, you know, or you could use a computer if you think you could get away with it, you know, some way. I don't think that I can, and I'm a network engineer. I can't rearrange it all these different ways, you know, kind of do it. But what I've done is I've taken, like, little circle this part and draw it off here, a line there, and kind of do this thing over here and make it into an equation. I've done pictures with it, like pictographs, you know, making little people pictures of it, you know, and how it would apply and all those things. I've done things graphically where I've used a graphic to symbolize it. I've done things um, symbolically where I've used symbolisms, you know, of different symbols that fit within a flow chart you know, in order to coordinate the conflict that's going on within the scripture itself and how it resolves itself and explains it. I've done just about everything that I can think of as far as creatively explaining or delineating out, you know, working through a text in order to make it applicable to my own life. So whatever you come up with for yourself, <laughs> hey, enjoy it. I did. I loved it, man. I'd stay intellectually into that field forever if I could. Studying to show ourselves approved unto God goes far deeper than learning all the facts of the text. There's more to it than meets the eye, as we already explained. B. We're only a B. Meditating on the text. Only as we meditate on large sections of Scripture will we begin to see the underlying principles of application of daily living. David testified, I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditations. From Psalms 119, 99, look it up. John 5, 39, look it up. Acts 17, 11, look it up. Meditating on the text, people like to try to assume that meditation is a bad, far eastern, foreign idea. Meditation is good. Meditation is based upon what you put in your mind and what you do with your mind. That's what meditation is. Thinking in your mind the thoughts that you should think. You consider, you ponder, you reason, you ration out, you wonder. I used to say, God. And then I'd think about God. I'd picture it. I would, and I know athletes love this term that some, you know, new ager, fear-mongering person is going to ter be terrified of it, but you visualize it. There's nothing wrong with visualizing God. <laughs> Hello? It's what you visualize that can make it wrong. Visualization is not a wrong thing. You know. I'll give you an example of why. There's a famous song that's sung nowadays, and no one thinks of it as being wrong, but it is the perfect example of Visualization. Imagine. I see it. I, it goes like, imagine what that day will be when I'm standing in your presence and your face is all I see. I can only imagine 
what that day will be when I'm standing in your presence, and your face is all I see. I can only imagine. It's that song I can only imagine. Standing in your presence. Oh, I can't think of it because I'm intellectual right now. I can't think of worship. So the point being is that he, when he sang that song, he says, I can only imagine, because he was imagining being in the presence of God. That's what you want to do. Imagine is good. That is meditation. It's imagining. It's visualizing. It's applying the principles of Scripture to your life in the way that you think it through. Think through these things. Think on these things. Consider them, ponder them, meditate on them. The Scripture says that this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, though thou shalt meditate on a day and night when thou risest up, when thou sittest down, when thou walkest on the way, when thou goest forth, when thou eatest, when thou sleepest, when thou... You know, whatever you're doing, you're supposed to be thinking about it. So really, I always said, hey, you know what, you got a scripture for everything that's going on in life, every moment of life, because if you really did, you'd say, you know, as the Orthodox Jew does, that you thank God for the very air that you breathe, because God has created in the beginning, and He created the air, you know. And you go on to these blessings, and you say, you know, bless our doubt, Lord, God, King Universe, who's given us air to breathe, God, bless our doubt, Lord, God, Universe, who's given us light to see, bless our doubt, Lord, God, Universe, who's given us eyes to see, bless our doubt, Lord, God, Universe, who's given us ears to hear. So you can be religious, you know, I mean, you can be really kind of stupid about it which is what the Orthodox did. Or, you could see that meditating on the Word sometimes gives you the person of the Word, Jesus. And that would be a good thing to do, would it not, as you can only imagine? There's only one interpretation of Scripture, but there are many applications. These open up worlds of meaning in life. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can apply the meaning of the words that are being listed in front of your eyes according to the wisdom that you've learned in your head by the knowledge that you were given in order to apply that stringing of those words together in a sentence structure that would cause you to be provoked in your mind to come up with a conclusion that you understand that which is being said. Because if you're reading it and you don't understand it, then it doesn't make sense to you. It's all gibberish. So you have to find what makes sense to you in just reading it. Don't worry about who interpreted an NIV who interpreted NASB, who interpreted the Living Bible, who interpreted any Bible. I don't even care if you had a New World Translation. I don't care. Because really, eventually you'll get rid of it. But the point is, in where you're at with what you're at and what you're doing, you are simply reading and applying. And how you apply it is what the Holy Spirit does, not the Word itself. <clears throat> Every Bible is good. Every Bible is good. Quote me on that. Every Bible is good. You know why? Because if a jackass could speak God's word, then a Bible can speak God's word too. And if a jackass could come out with the pure word of God to save Balaam, his skin, then guess what? God can begin with you in any Bible he wants to. And you want to. So start with what you've got. Don't go with what you think you need. Because, no offense, but the King James Version is probably the worst Bible in the world to understand. People do not comprehend what they're saying. They do not. I'm a English major, so to speak. I'm a freelance writer. I'm a creative writer. I have published books. I have done lots of English grammar analysis and all kinds of things. I could get a degree in it if I wanted to, or a master's degree, even a doctorate in it. You know, who cares? I don't want to like garbage. But the point is, is that King James is up there in language. It is out there when it comes to soliloquies and elocution of grammatical, effectual textual continu continuity within its grammatical structure, meaning that it flows for a reason because they were talking in front of a king, and they had to say it in a certain way. That doesn't mean it's the only way. It just means that it happened to be used from, as they say, the text is receptus, and it's kind of like, you know, kind of closer, you know, and better, but, you know, who cares? We're not that accurate. What makes it accurate and applicable is the Spirit of God in you, not the Word of God in front of you. The Spirit of God applies the word you're reading to your life. And that's why principles in applying Scripture are so important for you. To get it right so you don't get it wrong. Because it's not about the Bible you're reading. It's about the Word of God that you're living. It's about the Spirit of God that is breathing into you the words of God that God has spoken to you as you are reading them for the first time and applying them by hearing them audibly at some point in time in the future. So that way the word of God that was will be the word of God that is and it will be the word of God that you'll see that will be existing in heaven before you as you stand in front of him. Discovering the principles of the text. 
after a section of scripture becomes a living part of your thinking and we put related passages together, we begin to see underlying principles within that scripture which can be applied to our lives. Whenever you see anything in the scripture, there's a principle there. Like when it says, study to show thyself approved unto God. You can say the principle is, how are you approved unto God? Study. That's it. The principle is study. That's what you get from study to show thyself approved unto God, work on a new not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The principle is listed there at the beginning. The benefit is listed underneath it. The warning and the concern and the contextual um, qualifications of it are listed there too, as well as the application of it. All within that one scripture. A good illustration of this is found in 1 Timothy 5.18 and 1 Corinthians 9.7-14. Paul was emphasizing the right which ministers of the gospel have to expect a living wage. To support this, he used what first appears to be a verse out of context, Deuteronomy 25.4. But he goes on to explain the underlying principle which has universal application in verse 10. And of course, <laughs> I didn't see that one coming, so I'm unprepared. What is he talking about? Who cares? It's about money. I don't want to get into it. Me personally, you know, I understand that you know they should be talking about wages, but I don't believe in necessarily that part. I think within my study of the scriptures that you get what you pay for. You can get it free, freely receive, freely give, and that's what you should get from the Word of God as people apply it to you. But I do know that you know pastors. Elders, deacons, other ministers use a lot of times portions of scripture in order to justify or to coordinate a principle of having a vocational reciprocity for their avocation of serving the Lord. And within the parameters of whatever religion you're in, then let it be so. But as you study, you're going to find that, you know, don't put it as tithing. Just call it what you get, what you pay for, because that's what it really boils down to. So in these principles of life, I would say that let the Spirit of God leads you and guides you because as we have studied and as you replay this, because you should listen to this a second time, not just once. But whenever you're applying principles in Scripture, remember, it all fits together. It has to all fit. You have to take it apart and look at it, kind of look for little nuggets that might be in there that, you know, apply. You have to see how it fits in the bigger picture, in the context of where it came from, where it's going, what it's doing to you, how it's going to be done, what it's going to do, where, who, what, where, how, and why. You have to use some brain power, some other tools, because you're studying. And just like any good student, you know, you need to get a ruler or you know, some paper and write it down and begin to understand that you're studying, because that's what you're learning is a principle of life. You're not just living the life and going on and making your own mistakes and trying to figure out what you did wrong. This is to get you so you don't do wrong before you do wrong, so you do right. So in order to learn to do right, you need to do and prepare yourself to study so you have those tools available to you to apply to your life. Studying correctly and applying those principles are so important in looking at scripture. You can already see why you need to get and understand how you apply the scriptures because if you took your fingers and your toes, you can't count how many denominations there are. You can't count how many sects of Christianity there are. You can't count how many different ways that people interpret things. There's a good reason why. They're not wrong. It applies to them where they're at. At that point in time of where they're at. Now, I'll admit, the Catholic, maybe, he needs where he's at. Where he's at. What he's at. Doing what he's doing. Because God is in control of the Catholic. Just like God is in control of you. The Protestant may be needing where he's at, what he's doing, how he's doing, where he's doing, because God has him where he's at, doing what he's doing. The point is, are they doing what God says to do? If they have a personal relationship, they are. You leave them alone. You do what God tells you to do so that you're at where you're at, applying what God is at with you where you're at, doing what God wants you to do. That's how you are learning the principles of application and learning to apply the principles of life. Father, I thank you that you've given us these words and these applications of how to live, what to live, and where to live it. We literally don't understand what we should do 
as we ought to, but we structure our mind and build a little house to receive your understanding and your wisdom so that in our mind we begin to comprehend what you want us to do. We try to learn these principles so that we would be open to anything you tell us to do. Not so that we would close our mind to anyone else, but we would rather open the door so that you would walk in and see the inside of our heart and take and cleanse within us all that garbage that's in our mind so that we would be transformed from our old mind into the mind of Christ. That you would renew our mind, making us into the likeness and the understanding that you would have us to be from the Word of God only. So, Spirit of God, I pray that any person that's watching or hearing or seeing would be filled with your Holy Spirit. That you would cause them to come upon them, O oh God, Heavenly Father, right now, sending your Spirit to them, that He would be within them, that He would be fulfilling them, that He would be coordinating to them the Word of Knowledge, the Word of Wisdom, the application of the Word of God, that you would reveal Jesus to them in all spirit, in all truth, in all application and principles of life, that they would be blessed to find you standing in the very center of their being. Oh God, reveal that to them, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. May it be that you find that in these principles of life as we study them, that you take what you can, live it the way you want, and apply it as God leads you. So your life becomes not just a principle, but an example of a believer. God bless you. I pray you continue to walk with Him, to talk with Him, and to live with Him throughout all the days of your life.